<laughs> Danny Simmons, uh, I'm an artist, I'm a writer, and I'm an arts advocate. An active practicing artist for 25 years, uh, and I've been writing all my life. Um, the arts advocate thing, probably 20 years, no more than that, probably about 25 years too. I guess it, my art career started at the same time. I found out that there was no place for African Americans to show their work in the city at the time. So I started creating places for, for us to uh, show our work. So I guess that started my work as an advocate. Inspired to be a social activist, I suppose, and an art activist by my father, who was an ardent civil rights activist. And I grew up in a home that discussed civil rights, that discussed he, he participated in marches back in that era. He taught black history. So, I mean, growing up in that sort of environment, you know, it's, it's hard not to be sensitive to social issues. And for me, what happened was I thought that those social issues could be addressed through not just my art, but through the arts. And so uh, I started, you know, I think the arts can change the world. And I figured if I could provide uh, people with the arts, that they would have a more creative and fundamental understanding of humanity and their humanity and help to change the world in that way. I create opportunities for children to be educated and work in the arts. Uh, we at my foundation, which I started to that end, uh, employs teaching artists people who are professionals at working with kids, to um, work with them in the arts, to give them a sense of art history, to give them a sense of what they can do, what they can accomplish with their imaginations. Uh, I may sit in on a session from time to time. I may have kids over my house and talk about my artwork or my collecting and things like that, but I am not an art teacher, so I don't want that perception to be out there. I am more of an arts administrator and I'm more of a person to make sure that the resources are in place for those type of things to happen for those kids. Listen, we are tight. Me, Russell, and Joey, or Reverend Run, as the world may know, are really very, very tightly knit. Um, and so we collaborate on a lot of things together. We started this foundation together. It was my idea, Russell backed my idea because he thought it was a great idea. And we both asked Reverend Run, when Run DMC was still active, to perform. And we sold tickets and raised a quarter of a million dollars at our inaugural for this fundraiser. And so uh, we collaborated on that. Russell and I collaborate daily. Uh, he's the chairman of the foundation. I'm the vice chairman. I'm more involved in the day-to-day -day working of the foundation. And Russell's more involved in raising resources because of his unique position in the world um, to raise resources. But we are committed to making this foundation work. So we talk about that all the time. We collaborated on the creation of deaf poetry. I'm a poet, and I've been doing poetry shows in the galleries that we created. Uh, I introduced poetry into that, and I wanted to take it to a different level and collaborated with a young man named Bruce George, and I came up with the concept of deaf poetry, and we took it to Russell, and Russell also helped push it, and so we made an HBO show, and ultimately a Broadway play. And Russell and I collaborate on different things all the time, and Run is always involved and shows up at the fundraisers, and so we do, we work as a family unit. That book, and then what led to your um, pursuit of literature, writing, um, because it's not your first book. No, it's not my first book. This is not my first book, The Brown Beatnik Tomes. This book, 
um, really was for my love of the beat era and what it meant to poetry and literature uh, and the free form style that people pursued uh, then in writing and the idea of introducing um, social causes and also abstract themes into poetry and the way that they wrote it which defied many of the conventions that have been set in poetry. So I wanted to, you know, pay homage to that. But I also have always wondered, you know, America is such a funny place that race creeps into everything. And I also wondered what it would be like to be a black beatnik poet during that time. What would your issues be? Would they be the same issues as Allen Ginsberg and Lawrence Farrell and Getty? You know, what would the issues of a black person be? Vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, the early part, the civil rights movement, vis-a-vis -vis the, the 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 discrimination and the racism that black people uh, 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 not felt but are still feeling, how would that affect your poet as a poet, as a beatnik poet, being there? So I sort of imagined myself or imagined the life of that person, and I just wrote some poems uh, about it. But, you know, and I also created a number of freewheeling um, paintings that were spont spontaneous, abstract expressionist, uh, which was a painting movement, a, a visual arts movement going on at the time that the beats were forming, and created this volume called the Brown Beat Nick Tomes, which is an amalgam of paintings and poetry. Oh my God, there's so many people that inspired me. Uh, in the art world for so many different reasons. Um, you know, the spirit to create and, um, to cont and to give out to others, Romare Beard and Norman Lewis and all those guys of the Spiral Group who created the Sin Gallery so they could give back to other artists who didn't have opportunities. Them for their work, not only of their work as painters, but for their work with human beings and the themes that they brought out. I don't necessarily emulate either of their art, Although sometimes I feel myself very Norman Lewis this, uh, especially a few years ago. I was, it was, oh, your work looks like Norman Lewis so much. I said, yeah, well, I'm on a Norman Lewis thing. But with Fredo Lamb more in his pursuit of spiritual connections, uh, of course, the early modernists, uh, the modernist Picasso, Moreau, uh, the surrealist Salvador Dali, and then, you know, the African arts have always been a large influence. If, as you can see around me, I'm surrounded by African art. Uh, for, for visual and spiritual reasons, those creep into my work. Uh, the Mbuti people or the Pygmy people or the Twa people, same people, just different names for them, uh, of the Congo, they painted on bark cloth and created such beautifully stunning, visually lyrical work uh, that was, to me, abstraction, that it influenced me in such a great way uh, there's a painter named Watara, whose work is right there, uh, 718, whose, whose use of uh, modern, modernism and, and tribalism, I think, and I might be describing his work completely wrong, but that's what I saw, uh, influenced me, Basquiat, of course, all the people during the 80s who, who let comic book art and pop art creep into their modern work and their contemporary work create something new. All of that inspires me. All of that. Does music also play um, a role in your artwork? What do you listen to when you're painting? I listen to absolutely nothing when I'm painting. I like to paint in silence. Uh, I like to be able to do what I think called channeling. Channeling from myself and finding deeper things within myself and also channeling from some of the spirits that's running around in this house from all this spiritual artwork, the spiritual work. This is not really art, this African stuff. Um, spiritual work that's in this house, and which gives off some sort of resonance. Um, um, so I don't paint and listen to music. But my favorite music, you know, uh, some people may not believe it, but 60s and 70s rock music. I grew up in that era, and so the Jimi Hendrixons and the Led Zeppelins and the Janis Joplins and the Bob Dylans and all that music that people, and Sly Stone, all that music that had a message in the beat. There was a beat and there was harmony and there was fun and there was some serious messages and texts 
that was created in those things that 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 spoke to social issues that that still concern us. None of those things that the people in the 60s were protesting and the people in the 50s were protesting have gone away. None of the things that we fought for have been realized. I mean, maybe in some small degrees, but all those songs that were relevant to me then, you know, if you, you know, pick Country Joe and the Fish and he starts talking about that Vietnam song, you know, uh, it's the Afghanistan song now, it's the Iraq song, it's the next war song. So war hasn't gone away. Uh, maybe the huge war protests here in America have gone away, but the conditions that we were fighting for and fighting about during that period of time still exist. So, you know, those things influence me. Then there's jazz beyond that uh, because of the complications and the music and the rhythm and the lyrics, R&B. And then finally rap. I mean, I can't help but like rap. My family's mired in it. I mean, Run DMC and Russell and, you know. Uh, but when I do listen to rap, I probably listen to stuff that speaks more to my generation. Uh, the older rap, the what they would call old school now. You know, I, I really stopped listening to rap right after Biggie and all of them, you know. Uh, Public Enemy. Uh, I hate to say this, was one of my, uh, and Run DMC, of course, because I have to say this, but it's true. Run DMC, Public Enemy, were probably my favorite groups. But, you know, one of my favorite songs was, uh, you know, Schoolie G. You know, one by one, we're knocking them out. You know, so, I mean, I, I, listen, to, I listen to those music mostly when I'm riding in my car. I got CDs. You know, I don't even, so I put in a CD and drive somewhere on a long drive, and I'm like, okay. And that's when I listen to my music. A lot of political insight in the way things are run in your community, in your world, both in the out world and outside of the out world. Do you have any intentions of running for public office at any point? I am never running for public office for nothing. I, with, I, I am so glad that some people who are sensitive for the arts have gotten in office. Lori Cumbo and last night Ross Baraka. And, and, and Hakeem Jeffries, and I've held fundraisers for each of them. So I feel like I've been backing winners, you know, um, since, you know, since before I refused to do it. And then it, beca it just became so critical. And it, 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 it came to me, what's more important is that people need to acknowledge the power that the arts community has in changing the world. And beyond just creation of work, there is, you know, a political force, a voting block there with our interests. And politicians really don't pay attention to you uh, unless, you know, you are able to deliver votes or money. And so, you know, we can deliver votes and we can select our own candidates and we can get our own candidates elected as witnessed here all throughout Brooklyn. And, you know, now is witnessed in, in, in Newark that the arts can produce uh, a voting block and can produce candidates that come from within their ranks that are like amazing. And so I coined a phrase during the Lori Cumbo campaign is that there's power in paint. And that phrase makes sense. There is a lot of power in paint from a lot of directions, but there's political power in paint because we can come together and make a difference. So you mentioned Brooklyn. So you were not originally from Brooklyn. What, you, what about Brooklyn is so interesting that brought you Oh, there was a whole bunch of stuff that was interesting about Brooklyn. Brooklyn was all the fine girls were at. That was one of the reasons I came to Brooklyn. It was like, damn, them girls in Brooklyn are fine. Got fly, got style. Uh, not that Queens didn't, but Brooklyn had some, some exotic, unique, amazing people. Uh, and there was a lot of arts going on in Brooklyn. Not many, not, when I got here, there wasn't that many venues, but there were a lot of artists. Oh my God, every other person living next door was an artist. You turn, they were artists. They, you know, they weren't that many coffee shops, so we all were together in one coffee shop, you know, getting a smoothie or a cappuccino or something. And we lived out. I mean, Brooklyn had a density of creativity that was going on in the late 80s and early 90s when I started coming here. I mean, I, I, I moved here long before that, but uh, in the early 80s. But in the eight, late 80s, early 90s, when I moved to Clinton Hill, 
it was just on fire with artists. And I, I just, when I was trained in Brooklyn, I fell in love and stayed. Plus, Queens was too residential. Manhattan's too, too, uh, um, too, too urban. Brooklyn's sort of a, in the middle. It's got density. It's got diversity. And, you know, and it's got beautiful homes and brownstones. And so, you know, Brooklyn was like art itself. Um, first, you know, I'm on the board of several organizations, uh, and when I heard that Ron Carter, who I've always admired as an as a artist and a musician, and just, I didn't know he was a really cool human being until I met him, but just his work, his body of work is so impressive. When I got the opportunity to meet him, I jumped at it. And, uh, you know, um, he started explaining his his work to create a foundation. And I was like, I've been down that road. Uh, I know how to create a foundation. I know the rudiments and the bones of what is this. I've been running this rush thing now for almost 20 years. And I've been on the boards of every important organization in Brooklyn. I've been on the Brooklyn Library, Brooklyn Museum, BAM, Brooklyn Philharmonic, um, Rush, there's, there's a bunch more. I can't even think of them all now. Uh, Brooklyn Bridge Park. I've been on all kinds of committees that help shape what's happening in Brooklyn. I mean, for the last 20 years, my involvement in the change and the density and what's going on in Brooklyn has been at the table of all the organizations that have made this Brooklyn change. And I've always advocated for arts and I've always advocated for artists and I've always advocated for the poor and diversity. And I think some of my advocation has worked uh, because people are cognizant of that. And many times I was the only black person sitting at that board and clearly always the only artist. <laughs> you know, um, but sometimes there were other black corporate types, but, you know, they, they, their concerns were a little different than mine because I was advocating for, for individual artists. And I've sat on, I was chairman of NIFA, I mean, chairman of NISCA, um, on the board of NIFA. I mean, all this during these last 20 years has given me a perspective that very few people have. Uh, and I thought I could bring some of that knowledge and background to what Ron Carter is doing in starting a foundation to help children appreciate music and the arts. And so I offered my services. Also, we have a book. He has a book, I got a book. See, I got a book, brand new, The Brown Beat Next Homes. And he has a book about his life and his experience in the art called Finding the Right Note. And we thought we might get together and do a book tour. You know, I supporting his book, he's supporting mine, Ron Carter plays the bass, Danny Simmons recites some poetry, sell some books and explain who we are, what we're doing, and, you know, why we're doing it, uh, just like I'm doing here, and advocating for people who need somebody to advocate for them, our children and our artists. Okay, right now, the Brown Beat Neck Tomes is on pre-order at Amazon, all the bookstores. You can walk into Barnes and Nobles and pre-order it. Uh, it has international distribution. Um, you can order it soon from my website, dannysimmonspoet.com. Um, but the other thing is we're having a huge book party. Hopefully it's going to be huge. At Powerhouse Book, June 26. Uh, and Ron Carter will be there. And, He'll play a little bit, and I'll read a little bit of poetry, and, you know, we'll sign some books and have a good time. They're going to project some of my art on the wall. It's going to be an extravaganza. It's going to be fun. And Asha Bandeli will be the host, the great writer who wrote The Prisoner's Wife. My name is Danny Simmons, and I'm a citizen of Brooklyn. You know? <laughs>
My name is Danny Simmons. We're at Rush Arts Gallery in Chelsea for the exhibition I Can Do That. It's 90 artists over three galleries exploring abstraction, which lends to the title I Can Do That, because so many people think abstract. They look at it and say, oh, I can do that. A lot of people think that it's easy, that you, know, you can just go ahead and paint anything you want to, put it together and put it up on the wall and say, well, that's abstract art. And I just want to show the depth and, and the work that goes into creating art that's not traditionally figurative. And years of learning how to let loose and to mine that talent to come up with these varied forms of expression. It's an amazing job that has to be done by these artists. And so, no, everybody can't do that. There are various explanations of what abstract expression really is. But really, it's finding a voice within yourself and allowing it to come out unfettered on the canvas is the impulse to create with no reference to physical objects. So the piece that stood out most to me was the Maasai piece. I like the arrangements of the beads. I, I just like the way the artists put it together. I'm really overwhelmed. It's all about like where the imagination takes you. And seeing this art, you're like in the minds really of the artists and like how they're expressing their talent. When I look at some of these pieces, I see this natural things that is around us and how they kind of became an abstract artwork. I hope people will experience a great deal of wonder and I hope they experience a feeling of connectedness to the object and connectedness to the artist and try to explore the feelings of what they might have felt creating something like that. Welcome, welcome guys, Ashley Williams here with Rockney TV. I'm standing in front of Barnes & Nobles in NYC getting ready to interview Danny Simmons and his new book, I Dream My People Were Calling, but I could not find my way home, a book of inspirational readings and poetry. So let's go on inside, follow me in. Welcome, welcome, welcome guys, Ashley Williams here with Rockney TV and I'm standing here with Mr. Lovely Danny Simmons who is quite the art collector. I did my little research on Google and he's here today <laughs> to do a reading on his new book called I Dreamed My People Were Calling but I could not find my way home and right. I was curious to know, I mean the title says it all but if you could tell me maybe a little bit about the dream if that's what gave you the inspiration to write this book. Uh, well the inspiration to write this book, the book came in, in, in different ways. I had been writing the poetry for a long time and a painting of mine by that title inspired it to be turned into a book mm -hmm. because I had the paintings and I had the poetry. This was done as more of a project of me putting together and matching my paintings and poetry together. Then I sat down and said, let me do a book of paintings and poetry. Mm -hmm. But the painting, I dreamed my people was calling, couldn't find my way home, sort of said to me, a, a lot about the condition of fine African Americans and um, most people are feeling a loss at what's going on in society and not feeling really spiritually connected to anything. Mm -hmm. So I figured this book has a lot of spiritual aspects to it. So that's why I called it that. Is that what you're hoping um, the readers will get from the vibe of this book? You know, I, I did a I did a reading at the library the other day with a bunch of teenagers who were in class. And we interpreted the poems, and everybody who was in the room, and they were all poets, young poets, mm -hmm. and everybody had their own interpretations. And I, used, I told them mine last. And I feel like everybody's interpretation, even though I'm the writer, is as valid as mine, because words mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Sure. And so if the poem moves you to think about something in a certain way, and you end up there, that's not to say that what I meant is any more valid than what they got from it. So. Mm -hmm. Now, who or what is um, the people you're referring to in the title? I dreamed of my people. People can be taken as many different things. Well, my spiritual people, people, you know, people have a romanticized um, 
notion of what Africa is and was and this, that, and the other. And part of what that's talking about is not being able to find the Africa that was so romanticized in the 70s and the 80s and, you know, not being able to deal with the true facts of what's going on on the continent at the moment. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and being able to deal from where we are instead of dealing from a romantic notion mm -hmm. of the way things you want them to be. What's the next step for you after this uh, reading today? I, I, I'm chairman of the ball at the Brooklyn Museum, so I'm running from here to there. But uh, the next step, as uh, far as literally, is I have to do the sequel to Three Days as the Crow Flies and uh, just a number of other projects. I got so many projects on my plate so right now. Going on. And I did, when I did my little Google research, I, I saw that you have a place in Brooklyn and it's a uh, hallway, I believe, well, all filled with decorated with art. Is that open to the public or uh, well, just for your collection? No, 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 no. We have the Corridor Gallery in Brooklyn, which uh, is a project of my larger foundation, mm -hmm. the Rush Philanthropic Arts Foundation. And in uh, the Corridor Gallery is ongoing, uh, alternate, rotating uh, exhibitions in my uh, apartment. I have over 1,000 to 1,200 art objects. Wow. My loft, actually. And uh, so, yeah, that's open to the public. My apartment is not. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite kind of art that you normally try to go after and buy? Uh, well, there's, there's two aspects of it. I, I collect a lot of contemporary art, and I collect a lot of African art, and I collect a lot of comic books. So, oh really? You know, I, I'm not going to make a, a, a hierarchy choice between comic books, contemporary art, and African art because I love. I couldn't live without any of them. How many comic books do you have? About fifteen thousand. What do you plan on doing with all of those? Uh, they're just in boxes, but they, I have two kinds of comic books, vintage comic books from like the 40s and the 50s, which is my 401k plan. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> and then I have really like really. comic books I read, and go to the comic book store every Wednesday and pick those up. Right. So is there a, uh, a website at all that any of our viewers can go and check you out and everything that you're a part of? Uh, there's two websites that I would send people to. One is thecorridorgallery.org, and that has a lot of my paintings on it, about 100 paintings. Mm -hmm. And then if you want to know more about my foundation and the work we do with children, you can go to rushphilanthropic.org. Thank you very much, Mr. Danny Simmons, and good luck with the reading. And stick around, viewers. You guys are going to hear it straight from his mouth, so don't shake that stream. I'll see you later. All right, peace. All right, guys, there you have it. Ashley Williams here with Rock Me TV. Had a nice reading, had a nice interview. I had a great time. Hope you had a good time. And until next time, don't shrink. That's good.